I'd like to thank Keith for selecting that song for me. One of, um, I think that I talk well, but music is not my strong point. So Keith is kind of like my road dog when it comes to selecting the music, and that really segue very nicely or supports very nicely my topic for today, which is God is willing, are you? Because very often we put the limits on God. We put limits on God for various reasons. I'm going to start out with our anchor scripture, and I'm going to be working with a few different scriptures, but let's get this one in first. But seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all things will be given to you. Do not be afraid, O little flock, for your Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. So here we go. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and everything will be added to you. Also, do not be afraid, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So here's my question. If it's the Father's good, good pleasure to give you the kingdom, are you experiencing it? And if you're not, why not? You know, Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And if we can learn to live the teachings of Jesus, we'll have that abundant life. That's what seeking the kingdom is about. But the question is, are we doing it? And if we're not, why? In my experience, the reason that we don't do it is that there is some unwillingness about us to live the life that we should live, to do the things that we should do. So what I'd like to talk with you today is about what we need to do to make sure that we're willing so that we can be a part of the kingdom and that we can live the lives that we were intended to live. But first, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make sure that we understand exactly what the kingdom is. So I took a look at my metaph metaphysical Bible dictionary and I got a definition. The definition of the kingdom of heaven is the orderly adjustment of divine ideas of man's body and mind. In order to find this kingdom, man must become conscious of divine mind and its realm of divine ideas and be willing to adjust his thoughts to the divine standard. Heaven is not confined to man's consciousness. It is everywhere present. When man's mind and body are in harmonious relationship to divine ideas, his true thoughts flow into the world of manifestation and bring forth the kingdom in earth as it is in heaven. So the thing that I'm really focusing on there is for us to be able to adjust our thoughts and our bodies to divine idea, to divine mind. And very often we throw up blockages that keep us from doing it. So what I'd like to do today is I'm going to examine three stories from the Bible that will illustrate how we block those thoughts, that alignment with God consciousness. And then I'm going to have one that shows us how we can align ourselves, adjust our thoughts, so that we're in alignment with divine mind. So those three scriptures that I'm, or those three stories that I'm going to be working with are Moses, the reluctant lawgiver, Naaman, the egotistical leper, Jonah, the prophet without compassion, and then for the one that's going to give us our solution, the story of the humble leper. Let's start with Moses. Most of us know Moses from the story of the Ten Commandments. We see that movie on TV every year around Passover and, and Easter. Well, Moses is an interesting story, especially when you take a look at it in the Bible. We see that Moses lived as a prince in the Egyptian courts. And during the first 40 years of his life, he lived as a prince. He had all the privilege. He had all of everything it is that you could want. But he also knew that he was a Hebrew, and he saw that his people were being oppressed and that they were suffering. So one day he's witnessing a fight between an Egyptian and a Hebrew and seeing the Egyptian beating the Hebrew down. Moses looked to the left. He looked to the right. He thought nobody saw him. So he stepped in and he slew the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Well, the next day he found two of his own people, the Hebrews, fighting amongst one another. So he says, listen, let's be cool. We don't need to fight with one another. 
And one of them says to him, oh, so what are you going to do? Are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? So Moses says to himself, surely everybody knows about this. And as quickly as he could, he got out of Dodge because he knew that Pharaoh would be looking for him to punish him. For the next 40 years, Moses tended to sheep and worked for his father-in-law, Jethro. One day while Moses was out tending the sheep, he noticed something strange. He looked off in the distance to a mountain, and he saw something burning, a bush that was burning, but it was not con consumed. So Moses went to check it out. And we understand metaphysically that that burning bush is that inward desire, that inward desire for us to express the I am, for us to be about our Father's business, for us to serve our divine purpose. You see, Moses' divine purpose was for him to free the Hebrews. And when he tried initially, he went about it the wrong way by killing the Egyptian. He needed some quiet time for him to reflect, for him to get in touch with spirit, for him to get in touch with the I am. And that's what happened with him that day. That's what happened with him that day on the mountaintop. He had a conversation within himself with God. And God said, I want you to go, and I want you to free the Hebrews. So what does Moses do? Does he accept and say, yes, this is what it is I've been dying to do. This is my purpose. This is what I'm here for. Mm -mm. The first thing Moses says is, who am I to go, set for, to go set free the Hebrews? God says to him, don't worry about that. I've got you. I'll tell you what you need to do. God, this is not for me. They're going to ask me, who sent you? Who am I to tell them that sent me? God gives him his name. I am that I am. He goes on and says, well, God, I don't speak very well. I stutter. God says, don't worry about it, because I can bless your mouth, and I will put the words in your mouth so that you will know what to say. He goes on to say, well, God, they're not going to believe me. How are they going to believe me? He says, I will give you signs to show them. So for everything that Moses, every excuse Moses comes up with, God's got an answer for it. And it's like that for us when we start to face our talents, our abilities, and we run into fear. We let the past hold us back that we've had some failure. We have something in our past that's keeping us from moving forward. So when that divine idea comes forward, when spirit starts to talk to us, we come up with excuses. We say, I can't do this. I'm just me. I'm just Reverend Terry. I can't get up in front of a group of people and talk. God says, yes, you can. Well, I don't know what it is I'm supposed to say. God says, I'll tell you what to say. God, I'm afraid. And God said, I, says, I've got your back. The reason that so many of us don't do what it is that we're called to do is because of fear. We are afraid that we are inadequate. And in spirit family, there is nothing inadequate about any of us if we were rely on that I am that speaks inside of each and every one of us. You see, we carry around burdens that we need to let go of. We carry around the past. I failed at this before. We're afraid of getting out there and being hurt, and we don't want to feel that hurt anymore. But if you don't, if you're, not, if you're unwilling to get past that hurt, if you're unwilling to move past it, if you're unwilling to trust in spirit, you will not be able to live the life that God intended you to live. And that's what happened with Moses. At some point, he had to accept that God had his back. And what God did, and what God will do for you, when you're following your divine purpose, is that whatever it is that you need, the resources, the people, the circumstances, all that will be provided to you at the time that you need it. The question is whether it is that you can trust and whether you can let go of that fear. So that's the first way that we block God. The second way that we block God is we're like Naaman, the egotistical leper. 
We find the story of Naaman in 2 Kings, and let me get the scripture so that you'll be able to find it if you'd like to look at it later on. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. So Naaman is a great warrior. He's a general. And he also has leprosy. Now the thing that you need to understand about the Semitic people is that a person that has leprosy, the ancients felt like that somehow they sinned. Now we recognize sin as error thinking. So there was something in Naaman's consciousness that was an error. He had gone on a conquest and had captured some slaves from Israel. And there was a maidservant that he had given to his wife. The maidservant came back and said, you know, there is a prophet named Elisha. And if you would just but go to Israel and see Elisha, he can help to cure you, to cleanse you of this leprosy. So Naaman says, okay, I'm going to go. He goes and he approaches um, Elisha, and Elisha won't even come out to see him. Instead, he sends his messenger and says, bathe in the Jordan seven times and your leprosy will be healed. Well, this ticked Naaman off. He said, it can't be that easy. I'm expecting this man, he's a great man of God, to come out and to pray and say, God, come down and heal him. Wipe his leprosy clean. But that's not what he did. He wants to give me something so simple for me to go bathe in the river. Well, what's so special about this river? We've got great rivers back in Damascus where I came from. I'm going to go back and wash in them and be clean. That's our ego talking to us. Our ego that says, it can't be that simple. I've been working on this thing. I've been trying to figure it out. And you want me to do this simple thing? Mm -mm, can't be that easy. It's got to be something grand, something complicated. And we take the solutions that we get from spirit, and we twist them around, and we convolute them and make them, make them into something harder than what they have to be, because it can't be that simple. So one of Naaman's sermons, servants comes back to him and says, Master, if he had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? But all he told you was to do something simple. Will you not at least give it a try? So that made sense to him. He bathed in the Jordan seven times as he was instructed, and he was cleansed. In spirit family, sometimes when we are looking for solutions to our problems, the answer is so simple, it's right there in front of us. It's something easy for us to do, but we make it hard. We make it hard on ourselves because we let our ego say, I know better. It can't be that easy. It's got to be more complicated than that. And maybe you've been in a position that you've done that or you've seen people who've done it. I have a friend who will come to talk with you about something that wants to pick your brains for what it is that you think. And then as you're trying to give them an explanation, they're telling you what they think. They don't really want to hear what it is that you have to say. They want to talk. They want to get what they want to say out there. So they're not really open and receptive to what it is that you have to say. And we do that with God. We go and we pray, God, please tell me the answer to this. What's the answer to it? And the whole time, God is trying to tell us. And we're ignoring God because we just, it can't be that easy. We've got to talk over God. What we need to do is we need to learn to get still and to listen and stop talking so much and let God talk to us and tell us what to do. And then lastly, I'd like to talk with you about Jonah. Jonah, the, the prophet without compassion. All of you are familiar with the story of Jonah. Jonah was the one that got swallowed up by the big fish. But do you know why Jonah got swallowed up by the big fish? God had come to Jonah and said, I want you to go to the people of Nineveh and preach against them. And Jonah didn't want to do it. Why didn't Jonah want to do it? They don't really tell us in scripture, but Jonah had some problem with the people of Nineveh. There was some reason that he didn't want to go talk with them because he knew that if he went to talk with them, that they would repent and that God would show mercy on them. And he did not want God to show mercy on them. Is there anybody in your life that you don't want God to show mercy to? Is there anybody in your life that you have not forgiven, 
for something that they did to you 25 years ago on a Saturday at 3 o'clock, and you can, re you can recount it chapter and verse exactly what they did and what they said. You're holding on to what they did so tight that God can't bring anything new into your life because you're trying to hold them down. You're hating so bad on those people that you're blocking God out, that you're keeping God from getting blessings into your life. Your consciousness is choked up so tight that you can't let the good in. In spirit family, it's time for you to release that hold, let it go, and let something new come into your life. It's our unwillingness to forgive. It's our unwillingness to let go of hate that keeps us stuck, that keeps us in one place that will keep us from moving forward. And some of you are saying, but Reverend Terry, you don't know what they did to me. You're right, I don't know. And I really don't need to know because it doesn't make any difference. It's in the past and it's time to let it go. It's time for you to stop living 25 years ago and to live right now. That person doesn't care about you. That person's forgotten about you, and if they do care about you, they're probably glad that you're sad. They're getting pleasure out of it. But you, you're giving that person power over you instead of giving your power to spirit and letting spirit direct your life. So we've got these different ways that we're holding ourselves back. Let's talk about how it is that we can move forward and get ourselves adjusted in consciousness so that we can be in tune with God and live in the kingdom of heaven. So I'd like to read a scripture to you. Let me just get it here. And my scripture is coming from Luke, I'm sorry, from Mark, chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. I'm reading from the Lambs of Translation, and it reads, And there came to him a leper, who fell down at his feet, and begged him, saying, If you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus had mercy on him, and stretched out his hand and touched him, and said, I am willing, be clean. And in that hour his leprosy disappeared from him, and he became clean. Now there are a few things that are notable about this. The leper was humble. He didn't come to Jesus and say, I know better than you. He didn't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, you don't understand what they did to me. I can't let it go. He didn't say, Jesus, I failed before and I can't do this. He said, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, as I said a little bit earlier, leprosy was considered to be some sin or the result of some sin that somebody had committed in the past. Now, in New Thought, we know that there's not really any such thing as sin, at least on the spiritual level. There's error thinking. There's that thinking that we do that makes us jealous, that makes us not forgive people, that makes us hate, that makes us think that we know better than everybody else does, that ego that blocks us out, that error thinking that keeps us separated from God. But the leper was willing to be humble. He bowed down at Jesus' feet. And while I'm not saying that you need to bow down and beg anybody, we do need to have that level of humility when it comes to the Christ, the Christ that dwells in us and that's willing to talk to us and to forgive us and to cleanse us. The Christ is always willing to cleanse you if you're willing to humble yourself and to open yourself up. And so he said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus, representing the Christ for us, says, I am. I am willing. Be clean. And at that moment, in that very hour, like that, the leper was made clean. And that's the way it is when we get ourselves out of the way and we open ourselves up to spirit. When we open ourselves up to the Christ and we come humbly and not with preconceptions about how things should be, when we lay our burdens down, the Christ consciousness will move us to exactly where it is we need to be 
And just like that, we'll be clean. So in spirit family, I'm not going to be much longer. I'm going to bring this to an end. If there's nothing else that you remember from what I've said to you today, it's that when you come into the presence of the Christ consciousness, come with humility, come with openness, come ready to receive and ask to have your sin or to be made clean, to have it released. And if you are willing, the Christ consciousness will cleanse you just like that. Thank you and have a wonderful day.